Do you think it's a good idea to give politicians control over medicine? Do you think your life and death medical decisions should be in the hands of bureaucrats? I'm Mark Zakaria, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate because I don't want any Americans to suffer and die because of a medical mess created in Washington. I think it's a terrible idea to give government control over medicine. Obamacare will eventually lead to a system like Canada's where taxpayers pay a lot of taxes but are often denied treatment or have to wait months to receive it while they suffer in pain and their conditions get worse. What you're about to see in the movie that follows will happen here in America if we don't vote out the politicians who put us on this path. I'll repeal Obamacare to stop the government from messing up medicine even more. You deserve the best care at the best cost. America has a history of doing that in industry after industry, and we can do it in medicine once we get the government out. Senator Jack Reed voted for Obamacare. You can vote against Obamacare by voting against Jack Reed. Make your mark by voting for Mark Zakaria for the U.S. Senate. Now, there are those on the left who believe that the only way to fix the system is through a single-payer system like Canada's, where we, would, where we would severely restrict the private insurance market and have the government provide coverage for everybody. Overcrowded emergency rooms, a problem in too many hospitals. In that regard, Nova Scotia is no exception. An ambulance is en route to the Valley Regional Hospital. A man has been injured in a backhoe accident. Two or three minutes? Yeah. There's a scramble to find space in the already overcrowded emergency room. And a rumor of another accident, a car accident. Overcrowded emergency rooms. It's an issue in both small and large hospitals. The emergency department is in crisis. These nurses, x-ray technicians and ambulance workers were the first to go public with their frustrations. They work here at the Queen Elizabeth II Health Sciences Centre in the largest emergency room in the Maritimes. But when you have 11 patients and you're only supposed to have three, you know, we, things will happen. Medicines will be missed. Waiting lines of up to 16 hours, stretchers in halls. The emergency room so backed up, healthcare workers say patients are suffering unnecessarily. Doing that, then the money that they are Great spending to all uh, health care is money that otherwise would have gone to job What I want to do is just make a brief talk on the front end. Then... Welcome to Obamacare, a room full of politicians tinkering with the entire health care sector of the United States. This American hospital is on the front lines of the battle between doctors and politicians, between individuals and the state between freedom and force. I'm Logan Darrow Clements, and I'm going to take you just north of our border, where politicians have gained the upper hand in this battle. America's healthcare sector is sick, but will Obamacare cure us or make us sicker? Canadians know the answer. If we follow their story, we'll discover the terminal destination of Obamacare. Canadian politicians didn't mess around. They simply outlawed private health insurance and took over. And his name was Tommy Douglas. And in 1944, he came up with the idea of universal health care. A single pair, got rid of all the, the, this notion of uh, having uh, insurance companies involved in health care. If I am a citizen and I want to buy health insurance and somebody wants to sell it, yeah. you believe it's right for the government to step between us and say, no, you two not shall not Not only do I believe that, uh, most Canadians believe that. So you believe each person has a right to health care? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, quality health care though. Let's take a look at some of that government quality health care. I know it must be good because Canadians are always waiting for it. Here's what Americans can expect with Obamacare, or as Barack would say, now let me tell you what change looks like. So we end up having to just go to the walk-ins and wait hours and hours and hours and you never know who you're going to get. So you can't get a family doctor? I cannot you... get a family doctor. And there are studies done that, you know, almost 80% of family doctors in Ontario 
are not taking on new patients. And I pay my secretary an hour a day just to handle calls from people uh, begging to get into my practice, explaining to them what's going on, who they can speak to, but it's, uh, it's very difficult for the patients. If you're not satisfied with, the, with, with the, uh, the treatment that you're getting from your family doctor, you have a hard time getting another family doctor because there's such a shortage of doctors to start with. When I go down to the cancer clinic and you find almost standing room only people waiting, there's something wrong with the system like that. Well, I used to work in a remote area for five years and I remember that when a doctor came to open a new cabinet there was already people waiting in line the same day he arrived and in three hours he would fill up his list of patients for for the rest of his life if he wanted to. We're one HMO that services the whole province. Why is it so important to have a family doctor? Well, if you've got a serious illness, you probably need to see a specialist. But you're not allowed to see a specialist without a referral from a family doctor. According to the Canadian government, 4.1 million Canadians don't have a family doctor. I wonder how that happened. And then I remember in the Ontario government in the early 90s specifically decided that the problem was too many doctors. This group of bureaucrats get together and say, well, how do we uh, decrease the number of doctors? Well, first of all, the first step would be to decrease the number of medical school spots. And they started paying the University of Toronto not to graduate doctors. The size of them went down. The second step is to uh, decrease the number of doctors already present. Well, they paid a doctor's half a million dollars just to close up their practices. Provincial government uh, retired hundreds and hundreds of doctors, nurses, technologists, so that they would decrease their uh, budget costs. And this created a hell of a problem in Quebec. And their theory was if we have fewer doctors, it will cost us less money. And we tried to point out to them that uh, the costs weren't generated by the physicians, they were generated more by the patient demands. And the medical schools at the time said, if you do this, this is the early 90s, I said, if, they, if you do this in 10 to 15 years, well, 15 years, you will have a huge doctor shortage. It only took about 10. Because now we have millions of Canadians who have no doctor. If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. In fact, we're taking steps to increase the number of primary care physicians so that seniors get the care that they need. Just in radiology, we went from 540 radiologists to uh, 470. We lost 70 radiologists in one year. And we were already short, okay, and that's only in radiology. You can take this to every other specialty. Same thing for the nurses. I love nurses. I love nurses. We lost our senior nurses in the OR room. And they will testify, I love nurses before I got to Washington. There are approximately 300,000 people living in Montreal without a family doctor, but the province of Quebec will only allow how many new doctors in Montreal? Four to five. They deliberately created, and the irony is the people who masterminded this popped up years later as the people who were going to fix the problem that we didn't have enough doctors. But the problem is our population in Montreal grows by 15,000 every year. And you need, uh, you need seven or eight family doctors to treat that population. So, <laughs> you know, this is uh, not working. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor. In fact, more people will keep their doctors because your coverage will be more secure and more stable than it was before I signed this legislation. Waiting times are how a publicly funded, open-ended system works. In other words, and the Supreme Court of Canada, hardly right-wingers, have said that when you have, in theory, an almost unlimited demand, you have to limit the supply somehow. And the ways our system limits it is by not giving people timely care uh, there um, are now websites built in provinces by their medical uh, departments, uh, departments of health, that uh, allow people to go and check out what their wait list time is for a medical procedure. Look it up for yourself. Or go to any credible news outlet's website and look in terms of what reform <laughs> will mean for you.
The total number of medical procedures for which Canadians were waiting in 2009 was 694,161.